All right, my friends, I'm gonna share with you the most important book there is when it comes to financial planning. Spend Till the End by Larry Kotlikoff and Scott Burns. This is a dated 2008, and it's still incredibly, incredibly relevant today. Um, as you can see here, I've got tons of notes. I'm gonna read some of them. Um, look at all those notes I've taken, and just it's, it's just the most, this book changed my life as a financial planner and also as a consumer of financial uh, information as well. This book right here, Spend Till the End, is somewhat dated in terms of written is written 10 years ago, actually over 10 years ago now. I'm telling you, it still holds true today uh, than it ever did. And, and buy this book. I'll put a link to in the show notes. If you buy it through my link, I get paid a commission of 4%. So the book costs 13 bucks. I'll get, uh, I don't even know what it costs, frankly, but I'll get a little bit. So buy, if you're going to, you got to buy his book. If you do it, buy it through my link, please. Um, and anything else you buy through Amazon, uh, I'll get paid on that too. Um, but at the end of the day, I just want to share this with you because this book is great. And, and look, if you don't buy through my link, I don't care. I don't know. I just <laughs> saying that out there because a uh, uh, shameless sales uh, pitch. All right. So I'm going to read you a couple of chap not chapters, but a couple of uh, uh, tidbits or snippets that I uh, highlighted here. And this is his closing, Larry's. Uh, Larry, just real quick, I interviewed him for my podcast. Uh, he's a professor of economics over at B Boston University. Uh, the most, the most expert advice on social security there is in the United States. Um, that, that, in my opinion, without question, Larry is the whistleblower. Well, actually, a whistleblower from the SSA, Social Security Administration. Uh, whistleblown that the Social Security Administration was uh, denying widows proper credit to the extent of 135 million. No one listened to this guy, so that guy wrote to Larry, and uh, Larry got on it. Uh, that was in 2013, and finally the IG, the Inspector General, Office of the Inspector General, released a report in February of this year saying how the SSA basically mistreated, uh, I think it was like 10,000 widows to the extent of 131 million dollars that they didn't pay. Of course, they didn't, you know. They didn't make good on it, but they said we need to change strategies to avoid this happening. Well, they're not that happens, I don't know, but that's how that's that's the chops Larry has. Larry ran for president. Trust me, he's not a right winger by any stretch of the imagination. He's I guarantee he's far left when it comes to uh, politics. But he ran on the idea that the big three are the biggest unfunded liabilities, and we're in the hole for over two hundred trillion dollars: Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And he says this can't keep going on. And so he's written many books on that uh, generational planning, the, the bomb that we're facing. Uh, he was the guy who came up with the whole thing of uh, file and suspend when it came to Social Security planning, too. Is Larry, he's the one who found that provision, the, the loophole, if you will, and uh, which is why we no longer have it because Larry's books start getting out there. People say, huh, there's information here that's very valuable. So. I'm just gonna start with his ending, and it's Scott Burns. I don't know. I don't know what Scott does anymore. He used to have some kind of financial planning firm. I think maybe charged at 50 basis points or something like that. I think he was in Texas, if I recall. But I don't. I don't follow Scott. I just. I mean, he seems like a pleasant guy. I never met him. I just. He doesn't. Uh, I, I don't follow him. I probably ought to. Uh, so a safety first strategy is how they end the book. All right. So. Uh, so the first and foremost, we can follow. Uh, we can follow the artificially precise prescriptions of the financial services industry and experience very bad results that are very good for them, or we can follow the guidelines of economics, respond to circumstances with flexibility, and get much more closer to a smooth lifetime standard of living. We call the risk-reducing uh, guidelines of consumption smoothing our safety-first strategy. And here are the broad strokes. Secure your housing. Housing is a major albatross off the top expenditure, limiting our ability to spend our resources on other goods and services. If we buy, we have protection against rising ho housing costs. Yes, property taxes and homeowner insurance will go up. Yes, the house may develop termites or flood on occasion. But if rents go up, homeowners won't have to pay more for the housing services they receive from living in their homes. Uh, so you buy your home rather than, rather than rent, rent it unless the cost of buying is far higher than the cost of renting or if you expect to leave your house within five years. He didn't say that, but if you read throughout his books, he insinuates that. I'm, I'm telling you, if you think you're going to leave your house within five years, you probably ought not buy. Secure your mortgage. All right. Unless you are pretty sure inflation is about to take off, the best mortgage is no mortgage. Imagine that. 
Uh, and paying off your mortgage is the highest yielding safe return you can earn in the market. So if you, have, if you find you have extra money to invest, use it to pay off your mortgage. This is an economist talking who does econometrics, who has a social security planning software, maximize your social security saying this. Again, if you find you have extra money to invest, use it to pay off your mortgage because the best mortgage is not having any. Uh, man, I, <laughs> this is where I get my stuff. I mean, this is how I came to be who I am as a financial planner is based on Larry because it's just intuitive. Secure your longevity. Now that inflation index annuities are readily available, consider purchasing them to ensure against excess longevity. Of course, shop around for the best deal and make sure you that uh, any annuity you buy is fully protected against inflation. All right, the problem with that is I didn't find a whole lot of in inflation indexed annuities out there anymore. So I, I don't know if this, this is 10, 2008, I don't know if that's still an option. I looked at income annuities or uh, immediateannuities.com and they didn't have a default for that. So I, I don't know if you can still do that. But if you are gonna buy an annuity, uh, get inflation protected. Uh, get married and have kids. Remember the bumper sticker, be nice to your kids. They choose, they will choose your nursing home. Even better, they may take you in and keep you out of a nursing home. Get, getting married and having kids let you establish an implicit family insurance market, a mutual assistance society that may be vital in insuring you against unemployment, earnings loss, health expenses, and so forth. <laughs> be flexible. Most of us think binary. We want a yes or no or all or nothing answer. We don't want to hear on the other hand and on the other. We don't like ambiguity or uncertainty. Uncertainty. But the best we can do is mitigate the odds in life. We can do this on several levels. The primary level is something every person in the planet can achieve without any knowledge of investments. We can work hard to be flexible, multi-talented human beings. That means being prepared to do more than one kind of work, being will willing to ponder changes in how and where you live, and avoiding fixed ideas of what our lives should be. Considering investing just in tips, and this is 2008, Treasury inflect, inflated, uh, uh, Treasury inflated protection, securities tips. Tips are yielding 2.4% after inflation as they write. I have no clue what they're paying now. This is a very respectable rate of return with essentially no downside risk short of the federal government publicly defaulting on its, uh, defaulting on its debt. Before you invest in anything else, read Boston University Professor Ziv Bodhi's Worry-Free Investments and consider holding tips. There's nothing wrong with playing it safe. On the contrary, that's a major part of the consumption smoothing goal, a smooth but very safe standard of a, uh, living standard. Diversify your resources. Starting from a position of just holding tips in your financial portfolio, consider the riskiness of your overall resources. Even though your financial assets are fully secure, your overall resources may be anything but. You may, for example, work for an embattled company like GM. And that's funny, 2008, they're talking about it, now we're right back to talking about GM, which could fold in the upcoming years. If it does, this will wipe out in one fell swoop your earnings, your health insurance, your employer 401k, the match you're getting, and depending on what happens to UAW, your retirement health insurance as well. Uh, risky investing requires defensive spending. As we've seen, consumption smoothing requires that you gear your spending to your overall resource risk. If you are investing in risky assets to, in order to reduce your overall resource risk and you succeed in that objective, then you can sec be secure in spending at a higher rate. But if your financial investment strategy is intended to increase your resources and living standard, uh, you need to cut back on your spending a lot if things go dire. I agree with that 100%. Worry about inflation. Since 1926, inflation has run at an average of 3% a year. Since 1950, it's run at nearly 4% a year. With 70 trillion, this is 2008, it's much more than that now, in unfunded sp spending commitments, it's reasonable to believe that our government will soon start printing more money and that future inflation will be greater. And he has a book called The Coming Generational Storm that he's since published. Avoid complicated insurance products. One way the insurance industry collects gigantic fees is by creating complicated products and making big claims for them, offering higher than average returns at lower than average risks. Uh, these claims are invariable basis, and the products invariable incorporate very hard, high but hard to understand fees. Considering buying long-term care insurance. 
Nursing home costs are, quite frankly, the biggest risk many of us face in retirement. If you can afford it, buy long-term care insurance. I can agree with that. I have it myself. If you do buy it, buy it at an early age. And it was much inflation at protection as you can get. Oh, man, could not agree with that more. I want to read a couple other ones here real quick. Uh, I want to talk about uh, page 60. I got a couple things. I mean, I just got so much in this book. I could read the whole thing to you. All right. So here's what he talks about. A man who dies without life insurance doesn't die. He absconds. That's a quote. Uh, as, so what happens? The words of an ardent, So those, as you might expect, are the words of an ardent life insurance salesperson. While we would like to disagree with him almost all on general principles, because Larry's not a big fan of insurance, generally speaking, not, not complicated insurance, and most economists aren't. The sorrowful fact is that he's pretty much right. Each year, thousands of widowed spouses discover that their late husband or wife left them with little or nothing in life insurance. As a consequence, premature death is one of the major causes of impoverishment in America. <sighs> Let's face it, we don't like to think about dying, so we don't. But if we want to provide for those we love, life insurance is a great invention and a wonderful tool. It's one of the primary tools created to mitigate financial risks and help families recover from terrible events. Larry researching said roughly one third of secondary earners, almost all of whom are wives, are dramatically underinsured. I, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is huge for me because I'm telling you, husband, wife, husband does gets more of the money. You got to make sure you got insurance, husband. Okay, but what happens to my wife, Charlotte? What happens if she dies? What happens for my kids? I still got to go to work and earn the money. Who watches the kids at that point? Well, I got to get a nurse or a, a care, whatever it's called, a nanny or something like that. Where does that money come from? Insufficient insurance is the primary cause of poverty among widows. The most underinsured are secondary earning spouses between the ages of 22 and 39. Get your spouse insured. Not just the primary earner, the man, generally speaking, but the wife who stays home or the wife who is not earning as much. Get her insured. There is essentially no relationship between the amount of insurance coverage people have and the amount they need. Um, and Larry talks about, uh, found that couples age 30 needed a median of 12.6 years of income in life insurance, but on average they just had over one. Couples with a median age of 39 needed 5.6 years of household income and life insurance, but had only 1.9. I'm telling you, I could not agree with that more. This was huge for me to recognize the need for uh, the lower earning spouse, if the spouse is even earning, a stay-at-home wife needs to get life insurance. Uh, 45, and bear with me just a second. We're going to keep going through this. All right. Uh, diversifying your portfolio is generally a bad idea. See all these little tidbits, man? Uh, limiting our standard of living, uh, sta living standard risk requires diversifying all of our economic resources, not just our financial assets. But most of our economic resources are tied up in current and future labor earnings, social security, retirement benefits, and other non-financial assets. These non-financial assets are generally like bonds with respect to the rare risk properties. So diversifying our resources generally requires concentrating our financial assets and stocks so we already hold so much in bond-like activities, our resources, social security, pension, whatnot. Uh, let's see, this is part of the reason life insurance, okay, he talks uh, how children may lower your need for life insurance. I mean, he just talks about you need to get life insurance, but also that having kids may lower it. Children come packaged with their own life insurance policies on their parents' lives, namely Social Security survivor benefits. So my wife dies, uh, she should have insurance because it's so doggone cheap. But if she dies, I do get Social Security benefits on my four. Do I get on Maddie, my oldest? I can't remember, but I know I get on my three if they're under 16. Ugh. The rich have bigger savings and insurance problems uh, than others. Because of its progressive benefit formula, Social Security retirement and survivor benefits replace a much larger fraction of the pre-retirement uh, or pre-widowhood earnings of most workers compared to the rich. Stated differently, the government is doing a lot more saving and insuring through Social Security for those who aren't rich than it is for those who are. As we've mentioned, maximizing, oh, maximizing retirement contributions is generally undesirable. As we mentioned, 401k and other tax deferred accounts can represent a tax trap. But apart from taxes, contributing to these accounts may require reducing your current living standard in order to raise your future living standard. 
<sighs> this outcome occurs if your cash constrained, which is also referred to as borrowing constrained or liquidity constrained. You're basically saving money that you can't afford to save in order to have more spending money in the future. But that's not a good way to do it because you need the money today. Conventional financial advice makes little, if any, economic sense. It, its application violates the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Uh, as we now show, we're not exactly the picture of financial health. Oh, man, I couldn't agree. Okay, let's go get okay, 80, 95. We're going to keep going with this. I'll put this on the podcast so people can listen to it while they're sitting in their car. The or Oh, man, the science behind the replacement rate. Oh, I love this. The origin of the 80% rule. How much you need in retirement? 80% by current income. Why do we know that? Because that's the rule. Why? It's based on science. Yeah. All right. The replacement rate has a source. It ca it's calculated every three years by the Center for Risk Management and, Search and Insurance Research at Georgia State, of all places, using the DOL's Department of Labor's Consumer Expenditure Survey. At the Center's website, acknowledges it was established in 1969... Through grants and financial support from the insurance industry. The replacement rate study itself is, as we previously mentioned, financed by a Aon Corporation and a major insurance brokerage headquartered in Chicago. In, a, in other words, the replacement rate is calculated by the insurance industry, who has a incentive to sell you insurance products. The calculation itself is an exercise in reverse engineering. The researchers, he does a quote, scare quotes, at Georgia State, start with a pre-retirement income at various levels of household, married, single, different income levels, and make adjustments until they get to the spending uh, being done before retirement. They assume this income needs to be replaced, and then they calculate the pre-tax retirement income needed to cover that spending. And he goes step by step, which I won't bore you here today, but man, it's funny. Uh, sorry, it's an easy calculated number, but it will be dead wrong for most people. Let's see why. For starters, the calculation blithely or blithely assumes that a household spending after, after retirement will be precisely the same as the spending before retirement. The one exception being to this rule is work-related expenses. Spending here refers to all household outlays, but be it they on food, housing, education, medical bills, um, let's see. So let's get personal about this. One of us, Larry, is a pre-retiree. Larry's wife, Dale, is younger than Larry. Indeed, for the record, and to avoid future litigation, Dale is much younger. This explains why both their boys are uh, only 17 and 10. Again, this is 2008. Recently, Larry was feeling a tad self-conscious about being the oldest dad in David's fourth grade class. So he did some research. Turns out he isn't. Larry's not the oldest fourth grade dad, nor the second oldest. Nor the third, he's the fourth oldest, actually. Larry and his fellow geezer dads number among the millions of pre-retirees who still have young children at home. The pre-retirement spending involves significant outlays on children. For their part, Larry and Dale spend a bundle each year funding and feeding and clothing and transporting and entertaining, computerizing, summer camping, vacationing, electric, guitaring, piano lessons, blah, 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 their kids. The one saving grace for all the spending on kids is that'll eventually end. Exactly. So where does the pre-retirement thing or the the eighty percent retirement thing come in? Well, it doesn't. That's what's. Uh, uh, <laughs> you might think that research-oriented companies like TIA, Cref, or Fidelity would try to adjust for the brain-dead nature of the Aon replacement rate formula by asking questions about children, mortgages, and so on before ra uh, using that replacement rate. But no, they accept the whole idea. TIA Crest's goal and Fidelity's goal just ask just six and five questions respectively before using an 80% replacement rate uh, to pronounce you a savings disaster. Oh, man. All right, so let's see what else here. A couple other things. Uh, 187 asset location. That's one of my favorite topics. Uh, okay, so consequently, if you have both regular assets and retirement accounts, and you are investing in both stocks and bonds, you should hold stocks in your regular asset accounts and bonds in your retirement accounts. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Oh yeah, old Josh has told you that before. Exactly, yep, because stocks pay qualified dividends and long-term capital gains if you do sell, and they have a step-up basis on death so they transfer tax-free to your heirs. Uh, EBR, oh, so 218, here goes the Employee Benefit Research Institute study from 2007, and they say, um, 
The post-retirement versus pre-retirement re, uh, spending. Post-retirement versus pre-retirement from the EBIR, uh, RI, Employee Benefits Research, and this is from 2007. Uh, so workers spending level was were you thinking to be lower than you expected? 20% said it was. 20% of the retirees they expected it. So the workers expect 20% of actual workers expected their retirement spending to be lower than uh, than it was before they retired. Uh, and then 20% of the actual actual retirees said it was expected uh, lower than they retired. A little lower. Uh, 34% of uh, workers thought that retirement spending would be a little lower than, than uh, what it was when they were working. And 24% of retirees actually had lower spending uh, than they expected. About the same. 42% of retirees actually spent the same in retirement than they did as workers. And 34% said it'd be about the same. So basically between the two, um, and then only 6% of actual retirees said spending was actually much higher than they anticipated. And 7% said it was a little bit higher. So 13% in actual retirees, according to EBRI, said their spending was actually higher than they anticipated. 87% said it'd be about the same or lower. Uh, not said, it was about the same or lower. That's significant. Again, going back to the need that you don't need to... Uh, plan uh, for more and more spending in retirement. All right, a couple other things here. Uh, let's see, because there's a couple one I want to look at. Oh, oh, right here. This is funny. I love this one right here. All right, and we'll stop with this guy because, this man, I got so much to, man. So medical musical chairs. <sighs> the big gray wave, the biggest demographic shift in human history will cause this to happen, unfunded liabilities, uh, putting a significant debt on upcoming generations. Successive cohorts of retiring Americans will discover that the American healthcare system has become the equivalent of a Soviet era department store. Everything is offered, but nothing is available. Retirees will discover that they have been invited to play a giant game of medical musical chairs while the music plays, an increasing number of retirees circle a diminishing number of medical chairs as the ratio of retirees to doctors declines. In the case of frontline doctors like general practitioners and internists, the absolute numbers of doctors goes away. So that's this book. I know it's a lot that I chomp. I got so much to talk. This, this fundamentally important Spent Till the End by Larry Kotlikoff and his partner, Scott Burns, you got to get it, man. I know this is kind of yapping here, but it's critical. Critical, critical. Cr Even if you don't buy it through my link, don't care. Get the book. You will know more than 99% of financial planners out there, my friends. I'm telling you, uh, the financial planners don't pay attention to this. A lot of financial planners are simply, they get some, they pass a test, they call themselves a CFP, and now they go out there and say, I'm so smart. They're not students of the business. Something tells me most of you in my YouTube nation uh, channel here, a family, if you will, are more students of the business than the average financial advisor, even one with a CFP. Um, because if they haven't read that book, that, that book is fundamental. I mean, it's not the only book. I mean, I'm sure there are books I haven't read that other people say fundamental. Uh, but that, that, literally, you got to read it. And if you read it, you will have a complete different take on your own uh, financial planning projection. It doesn't matter if you're 65 or 35 or 25. There's so much, it's something in there for every person to read. So I invite you to read it. I am going to put this on the podcast. So if you're on the podcast for this, uh, please you know, do the five-star thing. Go to iTunes and do the five-star. Give me a review. As always, if you're on the YouTube, just link, uh, click, uh, what is it? Thumbs up. Yeah. Comments, thumbs up. And, uh, and don't forget to subscribe too. We'll see you next time. Thanks guys.